When I first arrived in the quaint town of Spoozum, I was looking for a fresh start, leaving behind a complicated past I wasn't ready to share. I chose this remote coastal village randomly and embraced it. With just over a thousand residents, mainly loggers, the town had a single grocery store, which I bought and expanded into a fully stocked market with a gas bar and liquor license. The business thrived, and I became known as a reliable newcomer. Early on, I built a log cabin on land bought at a tax sale, with help from new friends I met through the local mill. We designed it together using logs from the mill, and after much effort, I had a beautiful log home overlooking the village and coast, symbolizing my new life. One Friday, we gathered at our usual bar, listening to Bill Chapman recount his wife's infidelity. We supported him, reminding him of the financial burden of divorce. The four of them were lifelong friends and had welcomed me into their group. All five of us had served in the Marines. I had arrived in Spudzum over ten years ago, bought and expanded the town's only grocery store, and built it into a thriving business with multiple staff. A year after arriving, I began building my log home on land bought at a tax sale. My friends helped me design it, and their mill connections allowed me to buy logs at wholesale prices. The result was a spacious log home overlooking the village. Despite being trusted and respected, I remained a private bachelor, fueling rumors about my personal life. I managed my finances through an offshore LLC, avoiding personal income taxes. I used my middle name and kept my past, including my move from New York, a secret, after our second beer, we parted ways because Bill's son was arriving home with his fiancée. Bill wanted to be sober when they arrived, as he was proud of his son's new job with a top investment firm in New York. I was the last to arrive at the barbecue, wary of being set up by my friend's wives. Connie, Bill's wife, saw me pull up in my restored 1940 Ford truck, which I considered my pride and joy. You've got to meet Stephen's girlfriend, Jennifer, Connie said. She's 22, a redhead, and has two sisters and three brothers. I loved her the moment I met her. She's got a heart of gold. I wanted to warn you because redheads seem to make you sad and distant. I wonder if a redhead hurt you in the past. Grab a cold beer before joining us in the backyard. I got a beer and headed out to find everyone gathered with their kids and some extras. Stephen hugged me and thanked me again for covering his education. He introduced me to his girlfriend, Jennifer. When she turned towards me, I froze, looking like I'd seen a ghost. Jennifer was a spitting image of her mother, a redhead with a curvy figure. She was one of identical triplets, and the last time I saw her was the day I caught her mother with my brother. Jennifer's blue eyes lit up, and she started crying with joy. Oh my God, I don't believe it, she sobbed, rushing to me. You're alive! They told us you were dead, but I never believed it. The crowd was silent, shocked. As Jennifer hugged me, Stephen said, you know Charlie Howe, Charles's full name is Jonathan Charles Barnes III. Jennifer, still crying, said, I know, he's my dad. They told us he committed self-destruction, but I never believed it. My stepfather, Uncle James, always got quiet when we asked about him. I knew he was hiding something. I hugged her tightly, both of us in tears. It had been 15 years since I held one of my daughters. The love I had suppressed for so long overwhelmed us. Everyone could hear our sobs, waiting for an explanation. Calming down, I said, I was banished by my family to keep their lies hidden. They wanted to protect the family name and their political careers. I was forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement and disappear. This all started when I caught my brother with my wife, Jennifer's mother. I returned home unexpectedly after dropping the girls at school and saw them together. I filmed them with my cell phone, and they laughed when they saw me. There was no guilt or remorse. I showed the video to a judge, and my family decided to clean up the mess. My brother married my wife to boost his political career, and I was erased from their lives. For over 15 years, to those who knew the family secret, I was dead. Now I'm just Charlie Barnes, nothing more, nothing less. If fate hadn't stepped in, no one would have known the truth, I said sternly. I never imagined the truth would come out. Everyone was shocked. Some even looked like they might throw up. Connie was looking down, hiding her tears and shame. She was realizing the consequences of her actions from another's perspective. Once the truth was out, nothing would be the same. No one could understand unless they had been through the same struggle. Holding my daughter for the first time in years made me confront the unintended consequences of our family's secrets. I felt ashamed, and my tears flowed. Our healing had begun. To my grandfather, only money and power mattered. Everything else was nonsense. He had both. 
My mistake was confiding in him after catching my wife with my brother. I was devastated, and he was up for a Supreme Court nomination. A scandal would have ruined his chances. As I told him what I discovered, he immediately started planning to keep it secret. He watched the video and cursed like never before. His first call was to my wife's father, a senator from Maine. He explained what I had caught on video and sent him the file. Joan's father was furious and agreed to fly out immediately. They decided to discuss everything together before taking action. Before his next call, my grandfather set up a recording program. With a stern expression, he called my wife, using every insult imaginable. He came down hard on her and my brother for their childish behavior. If this gets out, your father's and my careers are over. This wouldn't be happening, Joan, if you had kept your legs crossed. James's family and the media will eat this up, my grandfather said. They'll claim incest on the front page. He signaled for me to be quiet, put the phone on speaker, and asked Joan if her three daughters were mine. She said yes. He replied, How do you know for sure? Maybe we should get blood tests, since you've proven unfaithful. Joan angrily said her affair with James started three years ago, insisting there were no others. The judge responded, Why should we believe you? You said you were on the pill to avoid more kids. James might not be your only lover. He then asked, Do you love John? She said she did, but now it felt more like a sister's love. Those words broke my heart. Seeing my pain, the judge was furious. Joan, in tears, admitted, James and I are to blame. If I had worked as hard at the marriage as John did, this wouldn't have happened. James pursued me after he moved in, and our physical attraction led us here. While John was away on business, our desires took over. We didn't intend to hurt John, but didn't stop until he caught us. Her lack of remorse was clear. My grandfather asked again, do you love James? She said yes, explaining that after I caught them, James asked her to be his wife, and she agreed. My grandfather responded, So James has taken his brother's wife, children, and life. What kind of people do that? Does John deserve this? Which? Joan said, We won't deny John his right to see the kids when our schedule allows it because James is planning a run for political office. We have to handle this quietly. James will be their new father, and John will be the distant uncle. Courts still hesitate to give fathers sole custody. My grandfather then said, Once this is resolved, I never want to hear from either of you again. In my eyes, you're both dead. He slammed the phone down. I had never seen him so mad. After a while, he said to me, Remember the pain and loss. They've made it clear you're out of their lives. It would be better if you were dead because that's how they see you. When your chance for revenge comes, show no mercy. Leave them ruined but alive. Joan is a conniving witch. She should have been a politician. I wish it were legal to eliminate because I'd eliminate your brother myself. With that, he punched the wall, breaking his hand. Jennifer, it wasn't my choice. Both families decided it was best after hearing your mother's call with the judge. Joan and James put both families' careers on the line. They had to be protected too. I said, still holding her. I can play that conversation for you later to explain more. But right now, let's calm down and enjoy this special day. Jennifer lifted her head off my shoulder, kissed me, and took my hand. Turning to Stephen, she said, Thank you for bringing me here. It brought my father back into my life. Dad, don't leave before talking to me, okay? I kissed her cheek and agreed. The barbecue resumed, and after finishing my bud, I let out a big burp. Everyone laughed, and Jennifer commented, That's the dad I know. He used to burp the whole alphabet. Bill and I grabbed more beers. Jennifer stayed with Stephen but kept watching me. Bill said, I was upset last night about my wife's affair, but now I understand why you stayed silent. Your experience makes mine seem insignificant. How you handled it amazes me. Can you give me some advice? I replied, Make Connie go to marriage counseling with you. She needs to understand her actions before you can forgive her. Each session will reinforce her shame and guilt. Connie still loves you, which is why she feels guilty. This will help both of you heal and find closure. Also, I approve of your son's choice for a wife. We laughed and returned to the party. Bill and Connie had prepared a lot. And as we finished eating, Bill made an announcement with Connie by his side. Most of you don't know, but our son Stephen graduated debt-free thanks to a scholarship from our good friend Charlie. Jennifer, welcome to the family. If you have half your father's character and wisdom, my son is a blessed man. Connie added, In your marriage, remember you're only human. There will be tough times, but never let pride get in the way. Bill and I are seeking counseling to work through our issues. It's easy to say I'm sorry, but understanding why it happened is crucial. Everyone agreed and toasted to them.
As I was saying goodbye, Connie thanked me for encouraging Bill to give their marriage a second chance. She said they would seek counseling and owed me big time. I looked for Jennifer, but couldn't find her. Inside, I saw two suitcases by the front door. I hope you're not leaving without me, Dad, Jennifer said. Stephen and I decided I should stay with you to reconnect. I want you to walk me down the aisle. I got emotional. Watching her drive the old Ford home was amusing. She had never driven a manual and kept stalling. Despite the challenges, it was a memory I would cherish. Once home, I started the wood stove, gave her a tour, and settled her into her room. She loved my log home with its spacious design and private bathrooms for each bedroom. Finally, we listened to the recorded conversation my grandfather had saved. She asked for a copy, so I gave her one, along with the video of the affair, which was recorded two days before my supposed end of life. She was left crying, processing the raw truth and betrayal. Hearing a loved one's lies had shattered her trust and faith. I poured us each a glass of wine and sat on the couch, looking at the village lights below. When Jennifer joined me, her eyes were swollen from crying. She sat beside me, and I held her without speaking. We finished our wine before she finally spoke. All my life, I was told they fell in love while grieving your end of life, and then married in the biggest wedding that year, Jennifer said. Hearing my mother's voice proves it was all a lie. I can't understand their coldness toward you. Was it out of hate? Mother claimed she loved you until you died. Now I wonder if anything they said was true. It will take time to process. I still don't understand it all myself, and there might not be an acceptable answer, I replied. Their marriage might not even be legal. If that comes out, James's re-election bid to the Senate will be over. I have a copy of the non-disclosure agreement I had to sign with the judge and your mother's father. I'll give you a copy before you leave. They stole your children and changed our lives in ways we'll never fully know, Jennifer said. It's like they played gods. Why did you let them? They made me a betrayed man. My grandfather believed they planned it all, counting on both families having too much to lose to expose the truth. They were right. They kept everything, and my ex took my business public, converting my equity into shares. The judge and your mother's father set up an offshore LLC in my name to help me restart my life far away. Now everything I do is through the LLC with no personal income to trace. The corporation is in a tax-free haven, and I manage its investments from my computer room, I explained. My grandfather told me the truth would eventually come out, and then I would be free. Now that you know, when I walk you down the aisle, people will see my face and their past will unravel, becoming a public scandal, I said. Our wedding is on August 6th. They've rented the hall, booked the church, and sent out invitations. Grandfather Barnes was supposed to walk me down the aisle, but... He'll give up his spot for you, Jennifer said. I want to release the information on the stick the Sunday before the wedding and start the search for your end-of-life certificate. Do I have your permission to tell your father you're alive? Yes, you can tell him. He might already know. As for why I didn't remarry, it's simple. Your mother and I never divorced. I couldn't remarry, and I didn't want to hurt anyone else. My morals and principles wouldn't allow me to be like them, I replied. Jennifer's face showed surprise as she realized the difference between her mother, my brother, and me. Dad, they imprisoned you. They took your life and children, making it impossible for you to start a new family. You were free but restricted, Jennifer said. Yes, it was also my mistake because I could have refused, but I chose to put the needs of both families first, I replied. I walked to the computer room, grabbed a large binder, and placed it in front of Jennifer, then refilled our wine glasses. She was amazed to see the binder filled with memories of her life. Announcements, public appearances, plays, report cards. She had forgotten so much. We talked into the early morning, sharing thoughts on memories I had never revealed. She went to bed knowing she had always been loved by me. I told her I had similar binders for each of her sisters. She stayed for two weeks, dividing her time between Stephen's family and me. By the time she left, we were closer than ever. I felt blessed to have her back in my life. On the last Friday of July, I ordered to short the stock of my former company, which was $129 a share. By the end of the day, I owned over a million shares. Jennifer's mother, the CEO, had likely changed the trust set up for my children. The estimated market value was $45 a share. Bill, Connie, and I were flying out the next Thursday on a private jet. Jennifer, keeping her vow of secrecy, called daily to update me. Using Stephen's phone, I instructed my stockbroker to keep buying shares until August 5th, 
selling only at the highest value to cover margins. The judge's conversation with my wife and the video of Joan and my brother hit the airwaves on Sunday. An adult website crashed from the video's popularity and the media jumped on the story. Questions arose about my supposed end of life and a search for my end of life certificate, divorce records, and estate documents began. By 11 p.m. in New York, Jennifer called from the West Coast, saying the news coverage was a blast. Her mother and stepfather were panicking, and her sisters, Judy and Joan, were seeking answers. They asked, Is our father still alive? Jennifer mentioned another bombshell would be released overnight. Speculation grew that I had been forced to disappear and possibly set up to be eliminated. Jennifer then said she would call my father and hand him the phone. I heard his office door close. Hello? My father said. Hello, Dad. John? Is that really you? He asked quietly. How are you, son? Yes, it is. I'm good. Jennifer can fill you in. How is Mom? How much do you know? I replied. We learned about everything a week after your supposed self-destruction. We're older but healthy. You'll be proud of your daughters. How did Jennifer find you? My dad asked. She found me by accident. Her fiancé's family threw a barbecue to celebrate his graduation. When Stephen introduced me to her, she recognized me. We've been in contact since, I said. I need to stay hidden until the wedding, so I'm flying in Thursday night with the groom's parents. Can I stay hidden at your estate? I'll make sure the landing pad is ready, and the staff will get extra paid days off. Mom will be thrilled to cook for us. Let Jennifer know your arrival time, my dad said. He wanted it to be a complete surprise for my mom. Early Monday morning, European markets saw my former company's shares drop over $20, according to FBN. At Monday's opening, I bought another million shares short, at $101 each. That afternoon, seeing the values continue to fall, I placed a buy order for 4 million shares at $45 each, selling all my shares at $65. Media hysteria, led by CNN, was destroying James and Joan Barnes, with accusations of incest, possible liquidation, and betraying dominating headlines. The FBI announced an investigation into my disappearance. By Thursday, my former company announced CEO Joan Barnes had accepted a buyout, stabilizing the stock at $35. On Friday, the stock began to climb, but James faced a Senate ethics investigation with calls for his resignation. He claimed he and Joan got involved only after my reported self-destruction and suggested the judge's conversation and the video were fabricated. CNN announced a voice audit to verify the conversation, highlighting that no end-of-life certificate for me had been found. Joan's father announced his sudden Senate retirement due to health issues, impacted by his daughter's actions. My former company's shares closed at $59 on Friday, confirming my purchase at under $45. Thursday night, a helicopter brought me to my parents' house. As I stepped out, my mother, overwhelmed with emotion, was supported by my father. It had been over 15 years since I'd seen them. My mother spent the next two days fussing over me, delighted to have me home. On Saturday, Jennifer stepped out of the church, signaling me to leave the limo. A CNN reporter caught me on camera and I declared, I'm the walking dead, before joining Jennifer. She looked stunning, and we walked in arm in arm, proud and beaming. Inside the church, I saw Joan leading the bridal party. She still looked good from behind. The ring bearers and flower girls followed, dropping rose petals. Judy, ahead of us, noticed me and silently signaled Jennifer to remain quiet. Jennifer nodded, her face radiant with joy. Everyone wondered where the best man was, not realizing he was walking his bride down the aisle. I saw Joan seated beside a man who I assumed was James, now with a typical dad bod and a bald spot. Joan and Judy cried as they saw me. I handed Jennifer to Stephen and took my place beside him. The ceremony was beautiful and emotional, with tears of joy flowing from my daughters. Joan and James, however, looked pale and avoided eye contact with me throughout the ceremony. During the evening festivities, I was repeatedly asked how I became my son-in-law's best man and if I had introduced the couple. When we signed the marriage certificate, the priest was shocked by my signature revealing to many that I was alive. Cell phones were buzzing and there were three live feeds. The judge and the senator had orchestrated a plan to avoid a scandal. After the birth of my triplets, I was called back to the Marines, where I served for three years, fighting the Taliban. I earned a hardcore reputation and faulty body armor left me with eight bullet scars. After my discharge, I went to the Cayman Islands to reorganize my accounts and met with the judge and my grandmother, who suggested I start anew by throwing a dart at a map, which led me here. 
In the congratulatory line, Judy and Joan introduced me to everyone, glowing with pride. Joan and James were the last. Stephen was polite, but Joan was in shock. Jennifer confronted her mother, saying she had found me and released the information about their betrayal. Joan was furious, but silent. James, stunned, said we needed to talk. I told him I had heard everything during the call with the judge. I offered them no sympathy, saying they would face the consequences. My daughters saw me smile as Joan and James left the church, knowing they were about to be served with divorce papers and alienation of affection charges. The media frenzy would only worsen their nightmare. We headed to the park for wedding photos. In the limo, Jennifer explained everything to her sisters who clung to me. They were surprised Jennifer had stayed with me for two weeks. My daughters had grown into beautiful women, making me proud. Jennifer shared how I had kept mementos of their lives, showing them how much I loved them. The only awkward moment was during the photo with all five parents. Connie and Bill stood between us, as James and Joan were in a foul mood, their world collapsing. The media dubbed me The Walking Dead, rehashing everything they thought they knew. At the bridal dinner, I gave a toast as the best man and father of the bride. I spoke honestly about my bond with Stephen, who I saw as the son I never had, and shared some humorous stories. I expressed my surprise at meeting his bride and wished them wisdom and happiness in their future together. My mother beamed with pride. When Stephen stood up, I nearly lost it. He began, It's rare for a groom to say his father-in-law is his best friend. Jennifer's father paid for my education and guided me through tough times. Discovering in June that John was Jennifer's real dad was a shock. My father said I was blessed to have Jennifer as my wife. To both of my fathers, thank you for making me the man I am. When the bride and groom started their dance, they captivated everyone. Jennifer looked stunning. Judy and Joan kept me on the dance floor, wanting to spend as much time with me as possible. Outside of my mother, they monopolized my time. Then the master of ceremonies announced it was time for the bride and her father to dance, but first gave the mic to General David Bloomberg. The general said he was there to award three medals to Hard Hat Charlie, a major in charge of a SEAL platoon. He recounted a classified mission gone wrong, where Charlie, stripped down to just his vest, helmet, boots, and underwear, bravely carried two bazookas into a clearing. His actions broke the enemy's resolve, and he saved many lives. The general presented two purple hearts and one silver star to Major Jonathan Charles Barnes III. I walked up, and the general pinned the medals on me and saluted. My parents and daughters were very proud. Jennifer led me to the floor for the father-daughter dance to Your Daddy's Home, a very emotional moment. During the mother-son dance, I joined Stephen and Connie on the floor with my mother, whose joy was evident. Later, the bride and groom changed into their going-away outfits. Jennifer found an envelope addressed to them with a $2 million cashier's check inside, signed by me with a note saying, Follow your dreams. Jennifer cried with joy. I slept until almost noon on Sunday, having gone to bed at 6 a.m. after the reception. Judy and Joan had taken me to a Chinese restaurant for a late-night meal, wanting private time with me. We exchanged phone numbers and addresses, and they arranged to visit me for a few weeks. After a shave, shower, and getting dressed in my usual attire, blue jeans, a white t-shirt, an unbuttoned denim shirt, black socks, and cheap Walmart running shoes, I felt at my best. I loved the simplicity of driving my old Ford truck. I came downstairs to a full house. Mom, Dad, Bill, Connie, their seven kids, and my two daughters. Connie was telling my daughters how I had saved their marriage, explaining how friends had spent years trying to figure out my story. Your father, though not religious, had the patience of Job. He never minded our attempts to set him up. We were stunned when Jennifer called him Dad. We had no idea. Until then, we thought his two black cats were his priority. After greeting everyone, I went to the kitchen for coffee and a smoke. Mom joined me, asking what I wanted to eat. I requested six pancakes, three soft eggs, and four slices of bacon. She was thrilled and started cooking, with the staff stepping aside for her. Dad came in to update me on the media frenzy. The New York Times headline read, The Walking Dead is Alive. CNN covered my military history, interviewing those I served with, who expressed surprise at my survival. One remarked, Charlie always found a way pushing himself and making us better. It was public that Joan married two brothers without a divorce, making me a known betrayed man. Senator James Barnes was mocked for his expensive promiscuous. CNN promoted the lifestyle, with feminists praising Joan, though even their comments faced backlash. A news crew interviewed people in our town, mostly receiving positive remarks. Dad laughed at the media's exaggeration, 
predicting I'd be seen as a saint without saying a word, while Joan and James were doomed. Mom brought my plate and watched me eat, still adjusting to my return. Dad? Joan said. James claims he didn't know what Mom told the judge because he was looking for you. Could that be true? Who knows, I replied. For three years, she was with him behind my back. They must have discussed the consequences. Your mother felt secure in her words, showing she was prepared. They expected the family to handle it. They used us all. Oh God, Joan said. You see it affecting everyone, not just personally. Who orchestrated it, Mom or James? James has never been a leader. Your mother and I are risk takers. It had to be her, I replied. Jennifer said your gift last night, if managed properly, would set them up for life. She didn't say how much, but they plan to invest it for five years, Joan said softly. The situation is just beginning to unravel. No one knows what the outcome will be. On Saturday, your mother was served. We're divorced, I said. When you and Jennifer get married, you'll receive the same amount. When did she get the papers? Joan asked. As she left the church, James got served too. I'm suing him for alienation of affection. The family trust is frozen because I'm not dead. Lawyers will dissect everything, and I might get their money too. James will pay a few million to settle, I said. Joan looked at me and said, Crap. The house they're in is owned by the trust. They may be screwed. It's a mess. I feel sorry for us all. Lawyers will take a lot. This was to protect those who no longer need protecting. Sadly, the innocent always get hurt. Judy had been listening and asked to talk to me privately. With Dad's permission, we slipped into his office. Dad, Judy said, I have a friend whose ex-boyfriend has been abusive. She has court orders against him, and he's been jailed a couple of times. He's set to be released next week, and we're afraid he'll come after her again. She's an RN and mentally and emotionally fragile. She needs a safe place. She was at the wedding last night and showed interest in a man she said walked tall and carried a small stick. Can I introduce her to you? Of course, but we fly home tomorrow, so what are you really asking? I said. Joan told us about her two weeks with you. I want you to take my friend home with you. It seems perfect for her to heal. Bill and Connie are great people and she'll fit right in, Judy said. If not for her, do it for me. Is she that important to you? I asked. Who's the man she's interested in? Yes, she is. She sees you as the man who can keep her safe, Judy laughed. Are you trying to set me up? I laughed back. Remember, I'm old. You can decide that for yourself. She'll be here in an hour, Judy grinned. Remember, Dad, age doesn't matter. A man will do anything for his daughters. I married Joanne right after high school. Her father introduced us when I was 16 and she was 15. It was love at first sight. I joined the Marines with my father's influence, excelled, and graduated with my degree in three years instead of five. By 44, I'd built a successful brokerage company. Dad and I were in the backyard shooting hoops when Judy and her friend arrived. Judy's friend Barbara Ellen Patterson had long, natural blonde hair and was 33, never married. She was five foot nine, had broad shoulders, and could play a good game of hoops. After a few games, we all chatted like old friends. I excused myself to make some calls and later called Barbara and Judy into Dad's office. I told Barbara I had a director from the local hospital on the line who wanted to talk to her. Judy and I stepped out. What's going on, Dad? Judy asked. She's being offered a full-time position in the emergency department starting in a month, pending reference checks. If she accepts, she can fly home with me tomorrow and stay with me until she finds a place. You'll need to handle her belongings, I replied. Judy hugged me and kissed my cheek. Thanks, Dad. I knew you'd come through. Joanne thought so, too. You've given her a chance to move on. Barbara accepted the position, and her transformation was amazing. Her warmth and loving nature came out, and it was a joy to see. Dad, being a lawyer, drew up a power of attorney for Judy to act on Barbara's behalf. I suggested Barbara set up a new email account to inform her contacts of her new phone number and keep them updated. Barbara, Judy, and Joanne were thrilled and quickly went to help Barbara prepare. Our plane took off at 4 p.m. and landed just before 8 p.m. On the flight, Connie and Barbara bonded while Bill and I talked about my family. Bill advised me to be careful, as Barbara seemed like the marrying type. My former company stock was now at $103. CNN would receive an envelope with my end-of-life certificate and grave location tomorrow morning. We arrived in Spuzzum around 9 p.m. I showed Barbara the small hospital where she would work before heading to my home. The farther we got from the East Coast, the happier Barbara seemed. Seeing my log home, she said, 
I haven't been in a log home since I was a child. We walked to the front yard to see the view of the village, the log mill, the docks, and the Pacific Ocean. It looked like a postcard, and she loved it. I told her dusk would come between 9.30 and 10. Entering the house, I mentioned she was only the second person to stay there. Neither of us knew she would never leave. Tuesday morning, I woke before Barbara. She looked refreshed and beautiful as she came downstairs without makeup, dressed in jeans and a tank top. Coffee's in the urn, sleepyhead, I said. Sugar's on the counter. Half and half is in the fridge. Good morning. She replied, Anything new in Charlie's world today? Let's find out, I said, turning on CNN. While she poured coffee and checked the fridge and cupboards, she noted we needed major grocery shopping. She remarked, It's a beautiful house, but it needs a woman's touch. CNN was covering my end-of-life certificate, signed by a doctor with a questionable past now serving time. They had dispatched a crew to the grave site. You knew, Barbara said. I did. The judge set this up long ago. After he died, I inherited his estate and had the caretaker mail this information, I admitted. She laughed. Judy, Joe, and I talked about everything. Joan and James are getting what they deserve. Your daughters adore you. Judy made it clear I'd be accountable if I hurt you. They think you walk on water. I promised Judy daily reports on us. Barbara continued. When I told Judy my thoughts about you after the general speech she started planning, she said, My dad needs a good honest woman. Let's drive to the port for your Washington State driver's license, nursing license, and grocery shopping, I suggested. We can have an early lunch at Golden Corral. Sound good? Yes, and I need to visit the hospital's HR to fill out an official application, she said, handing me her phone. Please enter our legal address. After coffee, she asked, Can I drive? I agreed, and she smiled wide, handling the clutch like a pro. I'm surprised how well you're doing, I said. I've been driving tractors since I was nine. If you can't drive a stick in the country, you won't amount to much, she replied. After lunch, we went to the hospital and then the state office, where she learned her new licenses would arrive within a week. At Walmart, we overloaded the truck with groceries, new copper nonstick pots and pans, dishes for 12, and new silverware. Barbara explained my kitchenware showed I didn't cook, which was true. While Barbara was at the hospital's HR department, I called my insurance provider. Our last stop was the local Jeep dealership where I bought a brand new, fully loaded Jeep 4X4. My insurance agent faxed over proof of insurance so we could drive it home. Barbara followed me back, driving the Jeep. When we got home, Barbara told me to get out of her way so she could set up the kitchen. She cleaned every cabinet before unpacking anything, organizing it like a new house. I watched in amazement, not realizing the significance. In the living room, I turned on the news. They had found my grave site and were questioning who was buried there if I was alive. The FBI would have to answer that. I heard Barbara on the phone with Judy, updating her. I yelled, Tell Judy you haven't assaulted me yet! Barbara yelled back, Your daughter says you can be a real pain. I laughed, knowing I was too old for Barbara. Around ten, we celebrated with large glasses of homemade blackberry wine, watching the town lights until heading to our separate beds. I woke to the smell of bacon. Barbara was making breakfast, wearing a homemade full-length housecoat and matching nightgown. That's hand-stitched. How long did it take you? I asked. Two months. How did you know? You can't buy that quality in stores, I replied. She smiled. I like a man who notices little things. Breakfast was almost ready. Six pancakes, three runny eggs, and four slices of bacon with pure maple syrup. How did you know that was my favorite? I asked. Your mother told me. You can place the eggs on your pancake, she laughed. What else did my mother tell you? That's for me to know and you to find out, she said, smiling. I thought to myself, I could get used to this. I told her, I'm going to check in at the store and pick up the plates. I paid the taxes on the Jeep. That's fine. I'm going to measure for blinds and curtains, she said. Before I left, she kissed my cheek. Dinner is at six, always, when I'm not working. I realized she was making this a home, not just a place to sleep. I returned at noon and put the plates on the Jeep. Barbara told me the FBI was digging up my gravesite, and CNN was covering it live. My end-of-life certificate had been issued the day before I re-enlisted. I got a text from the lawyers. Joan wanted a quick divorce and to deal with the trust separately. She wouldn't fight the infidelity grounds, which would speed up the process since she was already remarried. I agreed. You're making the right move, Barbara said. I'm done measuring. We need to discuss rod styles, materials, and prices. Why? I asked. 
because this town is growing and soon other homes may have a direct view into your home. Also, finishing the house will add value. We spent the next four hours ordering items online. After spending ten grand, I asked if she expected me to hang them. Yes, that's a man's job, but I'll help, she said. She checked in with Judy, who had inside knowledge of what the FBI found in the coffin. Inside was a bubble-wrapped FedEx envelope containing a note. Next time, James and Joan, when you try to eliminate someone, make sure the person you hire is competent. It was signed by me. I laughed when I heard that. Barbara asked for an explanation. I told her that before I left to report, the judge had me sign blank pages as if signing a letter. The note must have been one of them. Just as Barbara was about to start supper, I got a call saying my friends and their wives were coming to welcome Barbara to the neighborhood. I told her not to bother starting dinner because we were about to have a house full. Connie had spread the word that I brought back a classy lady, and my daughters approved. Everyone wanted to meet the woman who got my attention. They joked all night that they had to see it to believe it. Charlie had finally found a girlfriend. Within ten minutes, everyone arrived. I proudly introduced Barb. We had a potluck dinner. Country fried chicken, baked beans, nachos, cheese, potatoes, chips, fries, coleslaw, salad, fresh buns, two cases of beer, and pecan pie. The ladies loved Barb's dish choices. She fit right in, discussing the curtains and blinds she ordered, which would arrive Friday. We decided to meet Saturday to put them up, with Barb insisting on cooking for everyone. Early Thursday, we went to Ace Superstore. Barb wanted a big propane barbecue, a deep fryer, and a smoker with tanks. We also bought a patio set for eight with extra chairs, scheduled for delivery the next day. I bought pre-cut lumber to build an outdoor cedar table that would stand against the wall when not in use and serve as a main counter during meals. Barb loved it. Saturday at noon, we set up the curtain rods while the ladies hung the curtains. Everyone admired Barb's sense of design. Bill mentioned I needed a garage and storage room for the patio stuff before winter. I agreed, wanting a protected pathway and mudroom, all made with logs. Barb added, We need room for two freezers. Connie teased, Are you planning for more kids? Making everyone laugh. Barb blushed. Barb prepared 20 pounds of smoked ribs, a huge potato salad, pickled cabbage relish, and a regular salad. It was a hit. On Sunday, I made her breakfast and we took a coastal cruise with friends. I planned a trip to Seattle for whale watching and visiting the market after seeing how much she enjoyed it. Judy called Barb, who admitted she was in love. I felt the same but thought I was too old and set in my ways. My friends teased me about being in love and despite my protests, they knew the truth. Next week, a rock removal company would level the space for a four-bay garage with a storage area and in-law apartment. James and Joan were called into the FBI, and things weren't looking good for them. The FBI had narrowed down suspects in my attempted execution, and both were under investigation. James's re-election chances were plummeting. On Friday, the president of my former company called, asking if I'd consider becoming the new CEO. I requested a week to think about it, and the news leaked, causing shares to rally to $139. Late Saturday, a thunderstorm hit. As I lay in bed listening to the rain, my bedroom door opened. Barb walked in wearing a nearly see-through nightie. A lightning flash silhouetted her, creating a stunning image. Pretending to be asleep, I felt her crawl into bed, trembling. Her scent of fresh soap and lavender filled my nose. Her body against mine gave me an instant reaction. She wrapped her leg over mine, her arm around my chest, and laid her head on my shoulder. I hadn't been this close to a woman in years and was a nervous wreck. As she raised her head to kiss my cheek, I turned and our lips met. A gentle kiss turned into a lingering, passionate one. We couldn't stop exploring each other with cold hands, seeking each other's pleasures. It wasn't just Zex. We were making love. She claimed my mind, heart, and soul. In the afterglow, we admitted our love for each other. It was almost 10 a.m. when we got out of bed, driven by hunger. I went down and made coffee in just my pajama bottoms. While waiting for it to brew, I called Judy. Dad, Judy said, surprised. Good to hear your voice. Thanks, but what did Barb say to you at the wedding? I asked. She fell in love at first sight and has been on cloud nine since you came back. Whatever you do, don't hurt her, Judy asked. I chuckled. Just between us, she slept in my bed last night. We admitted we're in love. Judy got emotional, so I said I'd talk to her later. The coffee pot was ready, so I warmed our cups. The doorbell rang. It was FedEx with my divorce certificate. The court had waived the waiting period. I was a free man. Barbara came downstairs, glowing with contentment. Her phone rang, and she burst out laughing. After ending the call, she said, 
That was Judy. She asked if she could start calling me mom. She kissed me. You just had to tell her, didn't you? She had to know I made the first move because you never would, Barb said. She was right. I poured us coffee and walked to the kitchen table. After fixing mine, Barb grabbed her black coffee and noticed the letter from my lawyer. Seeing the divorce certificate, she looked at me with tears of joy. I hugged her. Is it time to meet my parents? She asked. I said yes, and she called her mother to confirm the family get-together on the farm during Labor Day weekend. Her mother was thrilled and agreed to do it on Saturday. Judy and Joanne visited before summer ended. We spent a day going through their binders, surprising them and Barb with how much I had kept. We flew into Cuyahoga County Airport on a private jet, rented a car, and checked into a Holiday Inn. It was a beautiful September day, and we had a plane book to pick us up the following Tuesday. Barb hadn't been home in two years. Her father and two brothers had been in the service. Being the first man she brought home, I expected to be grilled. The next morning, we drove to the farm and arrived early. Her mother ran out to greet us before we even got out of the car, shocked to see Barb with a man. Her father came out, and I was shocked. It was Bullfrog Patterson, my old drill sergeant. Well, crap, he said. Like all new recruits, I had thought he was tough as nails. Barb, what are you doing with this chicken? He cost me over $1,000, he laughed, shaking my hand. I tried to break him, but he excelled and became one of the best Marines I ever trained. He cost me a 1000 in bets because I never thought he'd last. Bullfrog, I said, as Barb and her mom looked surprised. I came to ask Barbara's father for her hand. I had no clue it was you. Are you serious? Mrs. Patterson asked. Yes, ma'am, I replied, noticing Bullfrog's wide smile. You got it, John, he said. My only daughter couldn't come home with a better man. With that, I got down on one knee and pulled out the ring box. In front of her parents, I asked her to marry me. Barb, completely surprised, said yes. I stood up, slid the ring on her finger, and gave her a big kiss. After congratulations and a warm hug from her mom and dad, Bull said, Let's get the truck keys and go on a beer run. We can talk. Barb's mom was crying, happy her daughter found a man her father approved of and got engaged on the spot. Bull and I went to the local legion for a couple of drafts. He asked if I was divorced and I confirmed. I told him how I met Barb and our story. He already knew I came from money. He proudly introduced me as his future son-in-law. Someone asked, how did he get the name Bullfrog? I explained, he was our drill sergeant in basic training. I joined at 16 with my parents' approval and he came down hard on me. One night in the barracks, someone asked me about him and I said, he reminds me of a bullfrog on a log trying to catch bugs and I'm the bug. The name stuck. We spent a couple hundred on beer and rye. I knew he'd try to get me drunk. When we returned, the yard was full of cars. We took beer and rye inside, then parked the truck for later. Barb greeted me, sliding her hand into mine. A voice in the crowd yelled, Hard hat, Charlie, is that you? I looked up. Measly Mike, how are you, man? We hugged, instantly reconnecting. Bull asked, You know each other? He's the best tech man I ever had, I said. Bullfrog trained me. I didn't know he was Barb's dad. Why did he call you Hard hat, Charlie? Someone asked. When I re-enlisted, I used my second name and made it to Major. I got the name on my last mission with my SEAL team, I replied. I saved Mike's son's life. Barb got everyone's attention and introduced me as her boyfriend. She whispered to me, I'm keeping the keys. You're going to be too drunk to drive. Barb's mom, Gloria, announced, I wish to officially announce the engagement of my daughter Barbara to retired Major Jonathan Charles Barnes. Charles asked for our approval before proposing. My husband, who trained him, gave his blessing in 20 seconds. Everyone seemed stunned, but Mike said, You're going to be my brother-in-law. For the next hour, Barb introduced me to her extended family. They were proud, and they got me drunk. I barely remembered how we got back to the hotel. The next morning, feeling rough, I asked Barb if I had embarrassed myself. She said, You outlasted the other two idiots. That didn't impress me as I struggled out of bed. Barb said I deserved it, and I vowed it would be the last time. During breakfast, Barb took a picture of her ring and texted it to Judy, asking, You can call me mom if you agree to be my maid of honor. Less than 10 minutes later, we were on a conference call with my three excited daughters. They were thrilled. We learned James and Joan were facing multiple FBI charges, their careers destroyed. James had DNA tests done on his three sons and found they were his, but their marriage seemed strained. My daughters doubted it would last another year.
The money for everything had been traced back to James, who, with legal authority given to him by Joan after my faked end of life, paid for it via the trust. This proved their plans started long before I caught them. James claimed he was being framed, but most thought he had lost all credibility. The trust, now worth millions, would be fought over for months. The court put it in the hands of a trustee until the settlement. My three daughters wanted us to fly to New York for a family celebration. We agreed to come when Barb's work schedule allowed. With Barb's approval, I accepted the CEO position with meetings on the second and fourth Friday of each month and secured conference calls three days a week to limit time away from Barb. Barb started her job at the hospital, fitting in quickly. Working in the ER of a small town allowed her free time, so she took courses to advance her career. She worked four 12-hour days one week and three the next, from six to six. I made sure meals were ready when she came home. Friends found my domestication amusing, wondering if they ever understood bachelor life. After three weeks, we flew to New York Thursday night for a press conference announcing my new position on the board. The court ruled that changes to my trust made after my false end of life were illegal. James and Joan were to get 19% of its value, and they had to buy any personal property at market value if I agreed to sell. I told my lawyers to keep their family home for them. After the conference, Barb and I went to my parents' house. My daughters and Stephen joined us on Saturday for a family welcome. We needed to decide where to get married and satisfy friends and family. With my parents' help, we chose to marry in Ohio, have a reception there, another one at home, and a get-together with our local crew. Barb's brother Mike would be my best man, Judy her maid of honor, with Jin and Joe as bridesmaids, and Stephen and Barb's other brother in the wedding party. We set the date for the last Saturday in December, fulfilling Barb's wish to be a December bride. After a family dinner, there was a knock at the door. My former wife, Joan, wanted to talk. My gut and my parents told me no, but Barb said, you must forgive her to be free from the past. I called Joan into Dad's office. Joan, I said, I want you to hear the last words I heard from you years ago. I was in the judge's office when he talked to you. Pay attention to the tone and what you said. I just emailed a statement to CNN confirming I was there when the judge recorded it and listened via speakers. Joan's face went white, realizing I knew the whole truth. I excused myself to get a strong drink, letting her listen to her own words. I returned after the conversation ended. Imagine hearing that from my side as you wrote me out of my daughter's lives. Consider the cheating, the hurt, and the pain. Did you ever say anything true in our relationship? Jennifer, Judy, and Joe have heard the same. They now question everything you and James ever said. They have lost all trust in you. I told her, to James and you... I was just a tool. When Jennifer found me, I knew I couldn't be the walking dead anymore. It was time to reclaim my name, family, and life. The family's secrets had to end. Joan looked shell-shocked, my words hitting her like arrows. Tears flowed freely and I couldn't tell if it was remorse or shame. I handed her a box of tissues and left, saying, I'll give you some time to gather your thoughts. I joined Barb and my parents in the living room. My mom was showing Barb old photos. Looks like it's not going well my father said. She heard her own words to the judge and his response before I let her speak, I replied. I told her to imagine how I felt hearing it on the speakerphone. I pointed out that our daughters heard it too, and now question everything she and James ever said. I left because I didn't want to watch her cry. She can no longer deny her lies. Are you okay? Barb asked. Just stating facts, I said. I feel a peace I haven't felt in a long time. The anger is gone. I can now accept whatever happens. Looks like Barb was right then, said Mom. I refilled my drink and returned to the office, lighting a cigarette and waiting for Joan to begin. We saw you catching us as the brass ring, Joan said softly. We thought it was our chance to live freely. When the judge called, James was with me. We saw it as interference. I didn't give my comments much thought. The judge was right. Your father had been notified and asked us to do nothing until he arrived. He flew down within the hour and was shocked by the conversation. He and the judge thought you set everyone up. Jennifer demanded DNA tests, and thankfully, she's my biological daughter. Both would have eliminated you if it were legal, I replied. Your comments showed everything was deliberate. Now you know why your father has distanced himself. The question is, what gave you the right to write me out of our children's lives? Our daughters want to know. Her tears started again, so I left the room. She's trying to justify her actions, I told Barb. She's shown no remorse, hasn't apologized. She's only sorry it's all come out. We're both facing prison time, Joan said when I returned. The FBI has charges of lying, tax evasion, faking an end of life, 
theft, and more. Our lawyers are trying to plea bargain. James and I think if you spoke up, it might help. They haven't asked me anything. Why would they? I was overseas fighting while you played games, I said with a smile. I can't help you. This is your mess. I often wondered if you ever loved me. Now I know you didn't. You'll learn the hard way that actions have consequences money can't fix. You didn't come to apologize just to save yourself. It's always been about you. Let me escort you out. You'll go to jail claiming it's not your fault. I couldn't stop laughing as she left. Mom and Dad were supportive. Barb and I had to sleep in separate beds, making me realize how attached we'd become. The warmth of a loved one can calm a troubled soul. Tossing and turning, I appreciated how much we'd become one. Around two, Barb sneaked into my room. I couldn't sleep without you, she said, bringing a smile to my face. It's moments like this that make us feel young. She climbed in beside me and I held her. When she saw my tears, she asked why. I finally understood what it meant to have a loving wife, I said. Barb's tears flowed and I calmed her with gentle kisses. How do you feel about having kids? She asked. I paused, then said, Kids keep the old young at heart. If you're okay with me being in my 60s when they're grown, I have no problem having more than one. Then let's start working on one, she said, and we did. Dad was already up when I went downstairs. The smell of fresh, perked coffee filled the air, bringing back childhood memories. Good morning, Dad said as I joined him at the table. Thanks for ruining my sleep, he laughed. Your mom woke me up when Barb slipped into your room to ask what to do. I told her you were both old enough to know. I'll tease her about it for weeks. Tell mom we don't sleep well apart, I replied, and we're planning for more grandkids soon. I guess we'll be looking for a home in Spuzzum. Your mother will want to be a grandmother again, Dad commented. Jennifer and Steve arrived first. We caught up and they were excited to be in our bridal party. They shared honeymoon stories and Barb told them about meeting her parents, including a video of us singing a barrack song drunk which got everyone laughing. Steve found it amusing that Barb's dad had been my drill sergeant and her brother one of my grunts. Judy and Joanne arrived later. Judy was thrilled when Barb asked her to be maid of honor. They caught up on gossip and mom bragged about our plans for children. Jennifer shared the video with her sisters and Steve had Barb send it to him to forward to his dad. Barb explained our plans for a four-bay garage with a storage section and a three-bedroom apartment above, connected by an enclosed walkway. The area would be leveled, and we hoped to match the house's stain and seal if the weather held out. The excess soil and rock would be used to expand the front yard. Then I told my daughters I had talked to their mother. They fell silent. Using Dad's internet and Barb's laptop, I played the audio of the Judges and Jones conversation through Dad's TV. My daughters were stunned. I don't believe it, Jennifer said. No guilt or remorse. She expected you to bail them out, Joanne added. She ignored your questions. She's so self-centered she can't see the damage she's done. Dad, Joanne said. Was she always like this? Before your births, no, I replied. After you were born, I noticed a change. I thought it was stress from raising you three. I hired a nanny and left the army to help. By the time I got out, you were almost three. We were strangers. She warmed up, but now I see it was a front. During that time, James moved in and started his civilian life. I began building my company. Our relationship was a facade while she built her future with him. That's why I asked if she'd ever been truthful. Judy said, It sounds like she had a mental breakdown from extreme postpartum depression that she never got help for. Both Barb and I had seen that often in our work. A personality change is a classic symptom, a coping mechanism. This might explain her behavior but not justify her actions. Sadly, this is the final straw. My mother and I are done. Her sisters agreed. I thought this is just something else she can blame me for, not knowing how accurate that would be. To change the mood, Barb asked the ladies to help choose their dress colors. I interjected, I'll be wearing black. When asked why, I said, because black is for grieving a loss. Jennifer asked, what will you be losing? I said, my freedom. That got a big groan. My dad saw me grab a beer and head outside to think, so he joined me. Son, don't second-guess yourself, he said. You made the best decisions with what you knew. Life is too short to look back. Count your blessings. Three beautiful daughters who make their grandfathers proud. A future wife with a heart of gold. You served your country, saved lives, and always took the high road. Today, you stand tall and proud, free to live your life. Dad, he continued, your daughters made hard choices like you. They see you did everything for the family. That says it all.
My dad always knew how to make me feel proud and clear my mind. Just think, he laughed. You may have grandkids older than their uncles and aunts. Focus on what's ahead and leave the past behind. With a smile, we rejoined the family who were busy planning the wedding. Barb, my mom, and my daughters were debating flowers and whether to have a church service or a justice of the peace. Dad and I spent the afternoon playing cribbage. I ended up losing $4.65. Let them plan, Dad said. Just show up at the wedding, it's the easiest way. On Sunday, before we left, my mom had Barb call her mother to share that we'd be getting married there. Barb's mom was thrilled and wanted to help organize everything. My mom insisted on covering the costs as her wedding gift. The mothers argued, but my mom won. Barb approved everything. I realized I was marrying someone just like my mom. As things came together, I questioned if Joan and I had ever really been in love. On the flight home, Barb mentioned her parents were flying out. Mom wanted to discuss locations, menus, bands, and more. Bull rented a truck for day trips around the island, something he had always wanted to do. With just over two months until the wedding, time was flying. Returning home, we found that the dive bar had burned down. The owner had no insurance and wasn't rebuilding, so I offered to buy the property. We negotiated the liquor license, contingent on council approval, which the mayor granted. By week's end, construction began on a back-to-back -back restaurant and bar, taking up a city block. The design used logs from the mill and concrete floors with a shared interior wall. Everyone was impressed. The exterior was to be finished in two weeks. The former staff were thrilled to work in the bar, now named Bullfrogs. A real estate agent leased the restaurant space. I hired a Seattle firm to design and set up the bar quickly. Barb's mother scanned her favorite picture of Bull in uniform, which I used for the bar's glass entrance doors, etched with his image and the bar's name. Barb ordered the furniture for our new apartment, and both our moms settled the wedding details. The day before her parents arrived, everything was ready. Thursday night, the new bar's grand opening was more successful than the old one. Everyone raved about the bar food menu that Barb had planned. We had 31 days until the wedding. Barb's parents were arriving Friday at 5. But that morning, Barb wanted me to drive her to the regional airport in port in the Jeep, saying it was a surprise. At the airport, a small six-seater jet landed, and I learned my dad flew his own plane. My parents looked great. We settled them in and shared beers when Barb's parents arrived. It was too late to cook dinner, so we drove them to our new bar. I let Bull drive my old Ford truck, which reminded Barb's mom of their dating days. Barb followed in her beloved Jeep. Bull was amazed to see his image on the main doors. My dad whispered, well done. I asked Bull to yell an order like he did in training. He humorously obliged and 16 former Marines fell into formation and saluted him. He shook their hands, greeting them by name. Gloria beamed with pride, saying, you will have to carry him home. Barb kissed me, saying, I love you. She told her mom that she hadn't known about the bar's name. Bull was deeply moved by the plaque that read, Named after the toughest drill sergeant of them all, Bullfrog Patterson. We all enjoyed Barb's menu. Dad and I carried a very drunk Bull to bed, and it was a night talked about for weeks. Later, Gloria revealed that Bull was being pushed into retirement after 40 years, and Mike was taking over the farm. They planned to move to town, but Bull was struggling with the change. Barb and I realized he'd be perfect to manage the bar. Gloria asked where they would live. Barb offered the in-law suite, warning about loud thunderstorms. Gloria asked how Barb managed them, knowing her childhood fear. Barb, with a knowing smile, said, Charlie helped me make them one of my favorite things, making my parents laugh. As Gloria and Bull toured the island, my parents looked for a new residence. We hadn't disclosed our plans to Bull, wanting him to see the area first. When the furniture arrived, Barb and I were busy unpacking when we saw an official car. It was the FBI looking for me. I insisted on talking with them with Barb present. We sat at the kitchen table with Agent Peter McCormick, who had troubling news. James was arrested for fraud, tax evasion, falsifying an end of life, attempted liquidation, theft, and assault on Joan, who had filed for divorce and faced her own charges. James was denied bail, but Joan was granted bail for the kids. An informer revealed James had been trying to hire a contract butcher. The FBI needed my schedule and plans for the next two months as they investigated. I noticed Barb's face turn white. The agents were taking it seriously because the trust had a clause stating if I divorced and died within six months, my trust would be controlled by my ex-wife. Until the trust was split and approved by the court, I couldn't legally change anything. Agents had been assigned to investigate and I couldn't change my daily routine. 
Barb and I understood the gravity of the situation. After they left, we discussed how to inform my parents and steps for our protection. It was the last Saturday we'd be together until the wedding. My parents had bought a five-acre lot outside of Port and finalized the deal. They linked up with a local contractor to build a log home slightly bigger than ours on a four-foot crawl space, with a custom kit arriving in three weeks. Bull was hesitant about leaving small-town life. While my parents were out, Barb, her parents, and I sat in the living room. I asked Bud how much he was taking from the farm when they moved. He said, We haven't thought about it much. I don't like the idea of neighbors 200 yards away. Dad, Barb said, Charlie and I wonder if you consider moving here to manage the bar. You can live in the in-law suite rent-free with a starting salary of $60,000 a year. Bud was shocked, but promised to think about it. Gloria later told Barb she thought it was a done deal since Bull was proud of the bar. They discussed what Gloria wanted to bring while preparing a big dinner. The four of us watched them drive back to Ohio. Back inside, I told my parents we needed to talk. Mom was heartbroken when I mentioned the FBI's visit. She blamed herself for not raising James Wright. I reminded her of the judge's advice and how she taught us to associate with people who build us up. Your teachings kept me balanced and strong. James just threw his away. Well, Mom and Dad, Barb said, I've got some good news to cheer you up, but you have to keep it to yourselves. I was puzzled but curious. My parents agreed. My doctor says by the time we get married, I'll have 32 weeks to go, Barb said gleefully. If it's a girl, she'll be Gloria Elizabeth. If it's a boy, Jonathan Charles Barnes IV. Mom almost screamed with joy, and I almost fainted. The day before the wedding, Bullfrog, Measly Mike, my dad, and the rest of the male bridal party were at the Legion for drinks after the rehearsal. The women were at Barb's bridal party. Bull was saying goodbye to friends, getting teased about moving to Washington to manage a bar named after him. James's plan was foiled. The contractor for the Eliminate was caught and got 20 years. Joan got a deal for time served and five-year parole by testifying against James. His trial would start in the new year. The trust was settled. Joan put the estate up for sale and filed for divorce. Our kids started kindergarten next month. Jonathan first, Gloria ten months later, then the twins, Silva and Wilford. Jennifer and Stephen have a boy and a girl. Judy married a Marine from Maine who works in my corporation. Joanne married Measley Mike and they opened a bullfrog's bar near the farm. Life is better the second time around.